When it comes to trying to understand human consciousness, what I've discovered is that it seems to come down to two camps of thinking. One camp, I'll call them the materialists or the physicalists, they believe that all you need to account for human consciousness is the material world, the materials that make up our world, and the physical laws that we've discovered governing the material world. The other camp, call them the spiritualists, or um, I think spiritualist is a good word for them, um, believe that there has to be some kind of a spirit or a soul inside animating us. That the, uh, the consciousness is completely a different kind of stuff than we've ever observed before, and you need to have some kind of a spirit or something supernatural to account for it. Both camps have really good reasons for their arguments, um, but we have a big gap in our understanding of what's going on. Uh, we need to understand a whole lot more about human consciousness. So when you follow the arguments, they seem to come down to this. The physicalist's argument, in real crudely, would be that um, up till now, we've been able to account for everything that we've ever uh, wanted to investigate in terms of the physical world, that if you look at the brain, there's no place where anybody's been able to figure out how the soul interfaces to the brain, how information would get to the soul, and how the soul inputs information into the brain to animate us. Therefore, you guys are crazy. In fact, why do we even need a brain if we have a soul that accounts for our thinking? The other camp, the spiritualists, when you really examine their argument, it comes down to, well, I don't see any way that you can account for what goes on as far as consciousness goes by looking at physical material. There's got to be something more. And I think you guys are crazy. Well, um, I'd like to examine both arguments, but there's an interesting thought experiment that uh, cropped up um, in a paper published in 1982 by a guy named Frank Johnson. He was a, he was a philosopher, and his, his exp thought experiment was called the Mary's Room Experiment. Now, a thought experiment is an interesting thing that we do in science. It's part of philosophy, it's part of science, and it's a, it's a way that we limit and reason in order to come up with hypotheses. I think that's the best outcome we, from uh, thought experiments. Eventually, it helps you put some bounds on the problem. You come up with a hypothesis, and you do have something you can eventually go test. Anyway, when you, st when, uh, when you start to think about um, the, uh, the problem of human consciousness and what's involved, the Mary's Room uh, thought experiment is, it, it doesn't reveal what it was supposed to reveal, in my opinion, but it very clearly divides up the people reasoning about the thought experiment into the two camps. So it re clearly reveals this divide, and it shows where you're at on this thought. Anyway, let me describe the Mary's Room thought experiment, because it's very interesting. The, um, the thought experiment goes like this. There's a brilliant scientist. Note in, in, in Frank's original uh, conception of this, she's, she doesn't have any supernatural abilities. She's just a brilliant scientist. Mary, and she's in this room, and um, for some reason, she can only see black and white. I think in Frank's original experiment, the room was colored black and white, but there was the problem of, oh, what if she sees her own skin and stuff? So let's just say there's some reason, she has some condition where she can only see black and white. Well, Mary goes on to study the human brain and human cognition, and she gets a very, very deep understanding of the brain. She's been working at this for years and years. She becomes the world authority on brains and understands the visual cortex and how we see. She understands, in, in Frank's words, everything there is to understand about vision. She knows the brain intimately. Okay, then for some reason, Mary leaves the room, or she's cured of her malady or, or whatever, and she is now able to see color. So Mary sees something red, and she has this intense experience of red. Well, now she just discovered, she never had this feeling before, she never had this experience. 
So in, um, in the original thought experiment, what, um, what Frank Jackson has to say about this is that she now learned something new. We thought she knew everything about brains, but she didn't. She had to acquire some new knowledge. He intended this to be a proof that there has to be something more going on inside the brains than the physical. That um, uh, I guess this eventually is, has come to be known as qualia, the experience of feeling something, what it's like to smell ammonia or to see um, red or to taste something salty. This is qualia. We can have a computer and a sensor that senses these things and tells us what the wavelength is of red and how salty something is, but we are very sure that the computer isn't having this qualia experience. Well, anyway, it's a, it's a very interesting thought experiment. What did Mary gain? She didn't uh, know about this experience she was going to have when she saw red, and now she has this experience. Well, there's been a lot of objections to this um, thought experiment, and it's the objections that are interesting. This is where people cut, reveal their biases and how they feel about this problem. Um, a lot of the objections are trivial, so uh, you can just ignore them. Some people are, uh, have criticized that the, the experiment couldn't take place, uh, that um, Mary um, couldn't be colorblind, she, she couldn't know all that much about the brain. Um, there, there are some very good criticisms. Um, some of them come down to um, w what is this, uh, you know, if we do acquire some new kind of knowledge by seeing red and experiencing red, maybe that type of knowledge doesn't count as the quantitative knowledge that we have, but it still doesn't mean that there has to be something in the brain that's, uh, that's experiencing the qualia that she doesn't know about. In other words, something we can't know about the brain by studying it. Uh, I have my own spin on this, and I'm going to add my, uh, or not a spin, I guess my own analysis of this. And um, this is what bothers me about the experiment. But well, like I said, this experiment is deep, and it causes some really interesting thinking on it. Here's my thoughts on it. Mary is said to know everything there is to know about brains. But she's not described as superhuman. She's a human. Now, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little farther here. It's, quite, it's possible for us humans to have a lot of knowledge that we can't really store in our brain because we don't have enough room. Um, I'm going to use an example here. Think of a man who's like a maintenance worker on a nuclear submarine. And let's say he's been doing this job for lots and lots of years. Well, he knows a lot about the submarine. But it's not all in his head. He's got manuals, technical manuals, describing all the systems on the submarine, the um, oxygen system, the navigation systems, the computer systems, the nuclear systems. There's probably, a, uh, there's probably a hundred systems. I can't think of them all on a nuclear sub. And he's got these manuals. He's got software um, uh, charts and printouts and He's got all kinds of data that he can call upon. He may not know everything right off the top of his head, but he knows what manual to look in, and after studying it a while, he understands how the nuclear sub works. It's conceivable to me that Mary could have this kind of an understanding. She or a group of people could have a very deep understanding of the brain. And they, uh, it might be in manuals, it might be online, um, all this information. It, uh, but uh, let's say that it can be pulled together when you need to really understand something. Well, what does that mean to have that knowledge? That's not necessarily a complete understanding of the feeling of things. Think about that maintenance worker. He may know a lot about that nuclear submarine, but there might be some subtle behaviors of that submarine, like how it, how it behaves, how it buffets, how it cavitates. Um, how things behave when it's not in its normal mode of operation and aren't really recorded in that, in that manual. Well, if um, the Ma Mary, the scientist, has this deep knowledge of the brain, how would she really understand how something feels unless she is running a simulation of that brain somehow in her brain? In other words, she'd have to be superhuman 
not just a brilliant scientist as the original uh, as the original uh, thought experiment had it, but she would have to have some kind of a simulation of the brain she's trying to understand running inside of her brain, almost house two brains inside her brain, and have some kind of connectivity from the qualia part of that simulation to the qualia part of her brain. In other words, her intellectual understanding of the entire brain is not necessarily going to send a signal to the part of her brain that actually feels something or experiences the qualia. So that's the part of the experiment that I think is not exactly right. What does it mean for her to have complete knowledge? Could she have, in the intellectual part of her brain, which is doing the calculating and the reasoning, it, you know, I guess when you stop to think about it, think about our own experience, we have, it feels totally different to have a feeling experience of something and to understand it intellectually. It almost feels like it's using two different parts of our brain. I mean, if they're not physically different parts, but I think that scientists have shown that they are by mapping functions in the brain, but even if they're not physically different, it feels like our brain being used in two different complete modalities, it's opposed to one another almost. So there's no reason to expect that Mary's going to be having this, um, this qualia experience while understanding the brain at an intellectual level. So that is the, uh, that's the objection I have. Um, we'll talk about in the next video what sort of thinking that leads to. Thanks. I hope this is interesting for you.